right now. I think we can do a little better than that, can't we? Good evening. Good evening. All right. I don't have a voice like the announcer, but luckily you won't have to listen to me all night. We're here for Jamal Joseph, and I want to... And I'd like to welcome all of you tonight. I'm Dorian Morn, an assistant professor here in political science, the School of International and Public Affairs, and in African American Studies. And the first thing I'd like to do is to, to say thank you to a number of people. First, the School of the Arts, where Professor Joseph is film faculty member, the Institute for Research in African American Studies. This event, you should know, is being webcast live courtesy of the Columbia Alumni Association. We will have Impact, who's in the house. <laughs> Impact will be performing at the end of our discussion and Q&A, quite a treat. I'd also like to finally, last but not least, thank the crew of the Miller Center, or the Miller Theater, rather. So a, a quick word about the format tonight. Professor Joseph will talk for about 20 minutes about his fantastic book, Panther Baby. And then we'll have a discussion between Professor Joseph and myself. With regrets, Afeni Shakur could not make it tonight. But she sends her love. So we'll have a conversation, Professor Joseph and myself, followed by Q&A, we'll open it up for about another 15 minutes, and then a performance by Impact, followed by a book signing in the lobby. And I should say, if you have not picked up your copy of Panther Baby, there will be plenty of opportunity. There are plenty of books outside after the event tonight. It is a compelling, compelling, amazing book. I could not put it down when I started. And I think we'll hear a little bit about it tonight. So let me introduce our main event. Professor Jamal Joseph is associate professor at the film program here at Columbia University School of the Arts. Professor Joseph has written and, di and directed for Black Stars, HBO, Fox TV, New Line Cinema, Warner Brothers, and A&E. He wrote and directed Drive-By, A Love Story, The Zone, and the docudrama Hughes Dreams Harlem for Black Stars. He recently finished the screenplay for and will direct Panther Baby for Focus Features. The book in the movie is based on his true life experiences as one of the youngest members of the Black Panther Party. Professor Joseph is the author of Tupac Legacy. He has also written the script for a Broadway musical based on the life of Tupac Shakur. He is the founder and artistic director of Impact, a Harlem based. <laughs> Impact is a Harlem based youth theater company. He's also executive director of New Heritage Films, a not-for-profit organization that provides training and opportunities for minority filmmakers. With no further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Jamal Joseph. Thank you. <laughs> There's so much love in the room. I feel so great. Um, uh, uh, Faini and I were in communication, texting, uh, texting back and forth this morning. She really tried to come. Uh, she's very, very under the weather. Um, and when her direct flight, she was coming from North Carolina. When her direct flight from Charlotte to New York got canceled, she just uh, understood that her body uh, could not deal with the later flight and that was also a connecting flight in the layover. And that also, um, on the tour, you'll see me, I'm running a little bit of a fever even as I stand here, 
uh, on the tour, there was uh, the beginning of the tour was from LA to Seattle to Boise to DC and back. Uh, thought I had the flu and kept getting worse. And um, then in Boise, I got bad enough where I thought maybe this is pneumonia. I should see it. Uh, see, should see a doctor, and um, uh, it, it happened that one of the organizers' husband was a doctor, and he checked me out, and he said, well, the good news is it's not pneumonia. The bad news is that it's a kidney infection. Your temperature is 104, and, you know, we're going to load you up with some antibiotics, but if you hadn't have come, you wouldn't be speaking at Columbia on Friday. You'd be in the hospital by Friday. So I'm glad that that happened, and, and you know, that Afeni is sick and then I'm sick, and listen, I know this is 2012, and I don't want to sound like those 60s conspiracy, conspiracy, you know, <laughs> conspiracy theorists. But on that first night when my fever was running high, I did have a nightmare <laughs> that I was in a hospital room, and Jay Gahoover was there with the big lab coat <laughs> and a syringe, and just laughing, laughing his butt off. Uh, thank you for that introduction. I, I do want to say proudly that I'm actually now a full professor here at the uh, at the School of the Arts, and really want to just thank again just uh, Dean Carol Becker uh, and Dean Jana Wright and the School of the Arts and the uh, the Institute for African American Research that's here. Uh, Focus, who on the student side really co-sponsored and promoted this event. That stands for Filmmakers of Color United in Spirit. Can I hear from Focus? <laughs> uh, and the room is so full of, of uh, it, it's almost like if you walk around and shake hands, you're going to be like, wait a minute, this book has really come to life. All of you people are real. I mean, uh, uh, I, I start out talking about my early experiences uh, in a wonderful mentoring fraternity. The Order of the Feather fraternity is in the house. Uh, uh, there's been great push by Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, thank you. Um, and, um, and, and, and just people that I, that I weren't sure was coming, didn't know were coming, who are here, people like Daryl Tooks, who's a childhood friend, and Kathleen Cleaver, Sister Kathleen Cleaver. We're gonna have to get her up a second who is the highest ranking woman in the Black Panther Party, is now a law professor between Emory and Yale. Uh, my dear, dear friend Nile Rogers is in the house. So it's been a wonderful and terrific journey. So the book was written uh, after years and years of everyone saying you should write a book. And you know, you go, yeah, because you know, you tell a few stories, you should write a book. But what really resonated uh, for me was when I would travel and also my young people in impact when they would ask the question what was it like and they would ask that question with a kind of passion and fire and curiosity in their eyes that made it clear that they wanted to understand what was it like you were 15 you were 16 you were our age what was it like it's like we would ask someone who got to play you know in in Madison Square Garden and landed a three-pointer. What was that like at that moment, at that time? Um, and so that's what made me understood that the voice of Panther Baby uh, had to be of that 15-year-old man-child trying to seek the path to manhood as much as it was to what his place in the struggle might be. And those growing pains and what happened that was good and what happened was that, was that, that was bad through all of that period. Um, I'd like to read just a section of it because it sets up a quick conversation. And the other thing that I've been glad about is that because it's written like that, the appearances that, uh, uh, that have been happening on the book tour, or oh, Whitney Peeling is in the house, my wonderful, wonderful publicist that's been working on the book very hard, um, and, and there have been conversations, not just about the book, and not just a nostalgic conversation about what, what life was like in the 60s, but what was it like, uh, what we need to be doing today? How do we continue that conversation? Because many of these problems, and I'll talk about them quickly and hopefully we can uh, get into it a little bit more uh, in the, in the Q&A, and this, and, and this is really important, finding the Panther layer. And don't think that I did not forget 
uh, Brother Bullwhip and Brother Shep and all of the Panthers who are in the house. <laughs> Panthers, did you think I was going to forget? Councilman Charles Barron is in the house too, another original parent. <laughs> Panthers, did you think I was going to forget? Come on now. Yeah, I called your name first, Whip. I called your name first. I walked into the Panther office in Brooklyn in September 1968. Dr. King had been assassinated in April of that year. Riots and anger flared in the ghettos around the country. The feeling on the street was that the shit was about to hit the fan. Black power was the phrase of the day. Hating Whitey was the hip thing to do. From street corner speeches to campus rallies, Whitey had gone from being the man to being the beast. Young black students were trading in their feel-good Motown records for the recorded speeches of Malcolm X and the angry jazz recordings of Ornette Coleman. I went down to 125th Street that night, the night that Dr. King was assassinated. Protesters and rioters swarmed the streets, clashing with cops, overturning cars, setting trash can fires, and hurling bricks at white-owned businesses. One of the storefront windows was shattered by an airborne trash can. Looters ran into the store and started taking clothes, appliances, and whatever else they could carry. Not everyone looted. In fact, most of the crowd continued to chant, the king is dead and black power. But it was enough for the cops to stop swinging, to start swinging clubs, shooting pistols, and making arrests. A cop grabbed me and threw me against the wall. Before he could handcuff me and put me in the paddy wagon, a group of riders across the street turned the police car over. The cop told me to stay put and ran toward the rioters. I was scared, but I wasn't stupid. I took off running in the opposite direction. I blended in with the group of rioters and tried to figure out which way to go. A group of cops headed toward us. Some of the rioters ran into a clothing store that was being looted. I followed. The cops entered the store swinging clubs and making arrests. My heart pounded as I ran into the back of the store and found a back door leading into an alley. I gasped for air as I ran down the alley and was stopped by a wooden fence. The cops came into the alley, halt, they yelled, put your hands up. In my mind, I froze, put my hands up, and turned around to face the cops with tears in my eyes. But my body kept hauling ass. I grabbed the fence and scurried over the top like a scared alley cat. Two shots rang out. One splintered the wood on the fence near my butt. This gave me the adrenaline push I needed to flip over the fence, pick myself back up off the ground, and scrambled out of the alley. I turned out on the street. I kept running right past two other cops who tried to grab me, but I jerked away. Turning the corner, I almost collided with a group of 20 or so black men in leather coats and army fatigue jackets wearing afros and berets, standing in military-like formation. Stop running, young brother, one of, the young, one of the men with a beard and tinted glasses said. Don't give these pigs an excuse to gun you down. I doubled over, heaving, trying to catch my breath. I didn't know this man, but his voice sounded like a raft of confidence in a sea of chaos. Moments later, two cops ran around the, con ran around the corner. They stopped in front of their tracks when they saw the militant men. The men closed ranks around me. What are you doing here, one of the cops demanded. Move aside. The black man with the tinted glasses didn't flinch. We're exercising our constitutional right to free assembly, making sure no innocent people get killed out here tonight. We're chasing looters, the cops retorted. No looters here, as you can see. We're a disciplined community patrol. You have guns, the cops asked, a tinge of fear in his voice. That's what you said, the man with the tinted glasses replied. I said we were exercising our constitutional rights. The cops took in the size and the discipline of the group for a moment and walked away. By this time, I caught my breath, but I was speechless from what I had just seen. Black men standing now, white cops. Go straight home, young brother, the man with the tinted glasses said. The pigs are looking for an excuse to murder black folks tonight. With that, the black men walked on. I scooted down the subway and rode home. 
When I entered the apartment, Noonie, my grandmother, was sitting on the couch watching images of Dr. King on TV. Tears fell from her eyes. She even, didn't even ask me where I had been, which is unusual, since I was about two hours late getting home. I sat next to her, put my arm around her, and we watched the TV reports of the assassination and the riots. Thank you. Um, also, I need to acknowledge uh, at, and, uh, Judge Bill Mogulescu, who was a lawyer that fought so vigorously for myself and other Panthers in the House. He was an attorney then, Bill Mogulescu. If y'all don't applaud, I'm going to applaud because I would not be here. My godmother, Angela Fontanez, and of course, and of course, of course, of course, a uh, prominent character in the book and in my life, Joyce Joseph is here. And my daughter, Jindai Joseph, and my son, Jamal Joseph, Jr. Uh, it was a few days later that, um, that uh, two older friends and I headed out to the Panther office, and I wanted to be part of the most militant organization on the scene, and of course the Black Panther Party stood way at the forefront. They had been patrolling the streets of Oakland, California with guns and law books. They stormed the state capital, you know, when the, when, and then when the authorities uh, were about to change the laws because that, the, the law that said that you could carry a gun in Oakland, California, uh, as long as it wasn't concealed and you didn't uh, have a criminal record, uh, they didn't mean black guys with leather coats. <laughs> and the Panthers responded by something that we would call a colossal event. They stormed the state capitol of Sacramento. And I had, you know, gone to school right after the riots and I announced to my friends that I was going to be a black militant. And uh, my buddies that always, we ate lunch together, I was a hall monitor, so there was a group of us. And one of my best friends uh, looked at me, his name was Paul, Paul, Paul Kirshen, a white kid, a Jewish kid. And he said, um, Eddie, I don't know if you can announce you're going to be a black militant like it's a career choice. <laughs> like you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer. And I was like, no, Paul, you watch. You watch, I'm going to be a militant. So I had to find the most militant organization it was. And there were the Panthers storming the state capital of Sacramento, reading the manifesto about black people's right to defend themselves. And then the news reporter came on and said, the ultra-militant Black Panther Party. Oh boy, there was that word, not only militant, ultra-militant. And then he said, and the Panthers' car was pulled over, and there were guns <clears throat> and communist literature found in the trunk. And I'm looking at grandma's black and white TV, and I'm going, they crazy. They crazy, they got leather coats. They stormed the Capitol with the white legislatures. <laughs> they had communist literature, they so crazy. I want to join that one. <laughs> so we traveled to what was the secret headquarters of the Black Panther, but we thought it was secret. Of course, the Panthers opened community uh, programs and offices all over, but to us it was the secret headquarters. Didn't know what we were quite getting into. And on the train ride out, my older friends are trying to psych, well, well, mainly to psych me out. I guess they thought if I got off the train, they had an excuse to get off too. So one friend leans over and he goes, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know the Panthers is like the mafia, right? Once you get in, there's no getting out. Uh, I can't be a punk in front of my boy, so I'm like, I don't care. Another guy leans over, he says, uh, yo, you know you gotta kill a white dude to be a Panther. <laughs> kill somebody. I'm an honor student, a choir boy. But I got to be tough. I don't care. And the other friend leans over. He says, no, nah, man, get it straight. Get it straight. You don't have to kill a white dude. I relax. He says, you got to kill a white cop. <laughs> and you have to bring in his badge and his gun. Well, my, my heart is pounding. We get to the Panther office. There's that great Black Panther Party uh, sign on the outside. All these great uh, Black Panthers are there, these brothers and sisters with their leather coats and 
army fatigue jackets and berets, and some of the sisters have their heads wrapped up in, in gay lays, and I sit in the back, and the brother who at the front is giving what we call a PE class, political education, and he's going through the Panther 10 point program, and it's points like we want freedom, the power to determine the destiny of our community, full employment for our people, decent housing, fit for shelter for human beings, nothing about killing a white guy. Nothing about bringing a cop's badge and go, am I hearing this? No, I'm still back on the train wanting to be a man. So I jump up in the middle of him talking about the 10-point program, and I go, choose me, brother. Ah, oh, me, I kill a white dude right now. <laughs> Whole meeting stops. He says, come here, young brother. Pulls open the bottom drawer of the desk, and he reaches in, and he's reaching so far, far down, my heart is pounding in my chest, and I'm trying to be cool, but I'm thinking to myself, look how far down he's reaching in the desk. He's going to give me a big damn gun. <laughs> and he comes up with a stack of books, and it's Soul on Ice by Eldridge Cleaver, the autobiography of Malcolm X, Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon, and I'm standing there confused, and I figure, this must be a test. And I go, brother. I thought you were going to arm me. And he said, young brother, I just did. As I'm walking back to my seat, he said, young brother, I'm like, now what? Because now I'm embarrassed. He said, let me ask you a question, because you came in here talking about you want to kill white folks. He said, of all of the cops who are out here beating people up, shooting them down, brutalizing them, if they were all black and the people being victimized and killed were white, if all of the store owners in the community were black and the people being ripped off with high prices and having to deal with rotten vegetables and spoiled meat, if they were white, and then he got a little pant on me, he said, and all these jive time demagogic fascist pig politicians, <laughs> he said, if all of them were black, and the people being exploited and oppressed were white. Would that make things correct? At this time, I answered with a little bit of my brain instead of my bruised ego, and I said, no, brother, it seems like it would still be wrong. He said, that's right. He said, this is a class struggle for human rights, not just a race struggle. Study those books so you understand what the revolution is about. And I learned the Panther Party was bold in that thinking. They were having a conversation about the problems in America, what they were really about, that slavery understood was a business, that the first slaves here were actually white, and then Native American, and then African, as the market got bigger and the need for control, that this was an economic problem, that the roots of racism in this country was a marketing skill for slavery, for white people that weren't sure that it wasn't a biblical sin to own a slave. You had white marketeers in the slave trade saying, it's OK to own a black slave because they're not human, so you're not sinning. Owning a slave is like owning a horse or a cow or a chicken. And so actually, you're not sinning. You're actually doing what the Bible wants you to do, which is to work hard and prosper. Ingrained in the very beginning of the American psyche, ingrained in the very beginning of the American economic system, where the first stock traded on Wall Street was, were African slaves where the first insurance companies made their fortunes by insuring slave cargoes, human beings, was the dehumanization of a people and was the victimization of the people. And it continues today. This is the quickest way to dehumanize a person, is to give them a name other than their name, a culture other than their culture, and to give them a name that allows you and an identity that allows you to dismiss them as your brother and your sister. I was disabused of that notion the very first day in the Black Panther Party. And then, uh, as I was leaving, a Fanny Shakur stopped me. She had been watching my whole little performance. <laughs> she said, how old are you? Now, when you're 15 years old, one of the signs that you're 15 years, years old is that by putting your age up a year, you're much older. <laughs> I said, I'm 16. She said, you look like you're about 14 or 13 years old. Go home. I said, I want to be a Black Panther. I'm not going, I told you to go home. I said, I want to be a Black Panther. She said, well, I will keep my eye on you. And she did. Through that experience, through my whole life, and I want to say this very, very clearly uh, to my comrades who were there with me, we served together, 
The men in the Black Panther Party clearly taught me how to fight, but it was the women in the Black Panther Party who taught me how to be a man. People see the news footage, what the media wants to continue to rent, run, was the, those intimidating you know, images of Panthers standing in front of prisons and patrolling the streets with guns. But day to day, especially a year and a half or two and a half years into the office, what you would see are, would, were women in that organization who outnumbered the, the, the men three to one, sometimes five to one because of the attacks, because of the men of the Black Panther Party being killed and going to jail and in key leader posi leadership positions uh, in, in all across the country. And in the same way that black women never gave up from middle passage to slavery to those hard times of the depression, even till this day when for whatever reason the men are not home and the women never give up the women of the Black Panther Party is the reason why the doors of those Panther offices stayed open. They never gave up. <laughs> and finally, as I was leaving that first day, there was a poster that was on the wall. And it was of Che Guevara. There, was, there, were, there were some, you know, there were great posters up there. There was the, the artwork of Emory du Douglas, and there were posters of Eldridge Cleaver, and uh, Huey Newton, and Bobby Seale. But the one that really caught my attention was uh, Che Guevara. And uh, it was just Che there, and it was a quotation from a speech uh, that Che had given a few years earlier. And the quotation was this. At the risk of sounding ridiculous, let me say that revolutionaries are guided by great feelings of love. And I stood there, and I read that again and again. I was like, wait a minute. I'm in the Panther office <clears throat> reading about love. What's wrong here? This is what Nooney always kind of, you know, talked about. You know, even though her parents had been slaves and she had witnessed relatives being lynched, and she grew up in the South where she had to step off the sidewalk when white people came by, and she had experienced all kinds of racism and brutality. She always talked about love, and Dr. King talked about it. And Minisync, the youth program that I grew up in, they talked about love. Here I am in the Panther office, and they're talking about love, and yes, it is about the real foundational strength of any struggle, that you do it because of love for the people. Now, any Panther will tell you that if you ask, if we're asked, what was it really about for you? What was it really about for you? Not the 10-point program and all of the books that you read by, uh, you know, by, by Fidel and by Fanon and by Marx and Lenin and all of the ideology of the Black Panther Party, if there was one thing that you had to say that motivated you as a Panther, they will answer the question like this, guarantee it. We were taught to have an undying love for the people. We were to, to, taught to serve the people, mind, body, and soul. And so as we started the breakfast programs and the health clinics and the liberation schools and the clothing programs, that community service, because we learned from the Civil Rights Movement that you organize people around their needs. It's very good, and I like to say this to my, my, to, to, to my friends on the left and to my, to my brave young comrades who are part of the Occupy movements across the country, that you have to organize people around their needs. When you talk about freedom and liberation, these are abstract concepts to people struggling to survive day to day. Freedom to someone who is starving is a meal. Liberation to someone who's shivering homeless is a dry, safe, warm place to sleep. And so when we saw that our children were saying, that they were telling our children, oh, you're underperforming, you're, you know, black children are not learning, well, we said, well, you know what? It's hard for black kids to go into school and learn arithmetic with the teacher telling them that two apples plus three apples equal five apples and their stomachs are growling. We need to start a community program to do this. And with no money, but going to a church basement, going to a church, go, can we use your basement? Can we use the dining room? Going to a, a community center. And then so we had a place to prepare the food. And then going to store owners in the community and not asking for money. But will you give us a case of pancake mix? The, the, the store owner across the street has given us a case of milk. The, the store owner down the street has given us a case of eggs. We can feed some kids. 
Panthers would come out and cook, and then grandmothers and mothers would come out and cook. And we started the first week maybe with 50 kids. And in a month, that became 500 kids. There are kids today that come up and says, I was fed in that breakfast program. I got healed in that health clinic. No money. Ask a doctor or a nurse to come and volunteer a Saturday, bring some medicine, help heal the community. And people responded to that. And when people would come into the community seeking to attack and to vilify the Black Panther Party, it would be those same grandmothers that says, I can't even pronounce some of the words, terrorists, all that, what you're saying, but I know they feed my babies. <laughs> I know I get my diabetes medicine from them. I know that they care. So it's on that ground organizing that we hope that people remember. That having rallies is a great thing. We have to affect policy. But we have to remember it is about the people and that you organize people around your needs. That's love. It's love that makes you get up at 4 o'clock in the morning when it's cold to feed kids that are not your kids. It's love that makes you, when your legs are achy from a day of organizing, that makes you get off the bus to help that grandmother eight flights up in her walker with her bags and then back down. And it's love that makes you get back off that bus when we were Panthers and stand between a cop who has their gun drawn on a black person and stand between that gun and that cop, and we don't know that person, but we understand that's our brother and sister, and if we don't stand, maybe nobody will stand. That's revolutionary love. <laughs> so um, uh, I know I have to keep my remarks to leave sometimes for the, uh, for the question in the audience, but it, it is so, I'm so grateful for tonight, and I'm so grateful to, uh, to be able to stand here truly, in what's truly a family reunion. I mean, some people talk about that and they get the family to come out, but from every as aspect of my life, from the time that I was growing up in the North Bronx to being a professor here at, at Columbia University now, uh, and, and I'll just close with this story. I have to tell this one because um, uh, it, it really sums it up. You know, as uh, Columbia used to be the place that would throw down like instantly when something would go, right? For, for, our, for our Columbia faculty and alum that remember those times, uh, something would happen, they would shut it down. And keep in mind, when we're talking about repression, and when we go back to the time when J. Edgar Hoover testified against the Black Panther Party before con Congress in 1968, where he called the Black Panther Party the greatest threat to the internal security of America. This is interesting, people. Research this. You know what bothered him the most? It wasn't the socialist rhetoric. It wasn't the guns. It was the free breakfast program. <laughs> to him, this was the most insurgent thing that we were doing, was feeding kids and reaching, and reaching community. And the response to the government against student protests, never mind what happened to the Black Panther Party, the arrest of the Panther 21, the murder of Fred Hampton, the shootout in LA, the bombing of our officers, never mind that. Never mind that. But on college campuses, when students were standing up, National Guards and sheriffs were murdering students, murdering students. I remember giving a speech at 17 years old because students in Mississippi State had been killed, and then students in Kent State had been killed. And I said that America, and I'm pretty sure this is what I said to a crowd, that Amer America will murder any nigger who stands up. But what Kent State shows us is that as far as America is concerned, anybody who stands up is a nigger because they kill those white students in cold blood. So we have to understand that if we don't understand that we're one, if we don't understand in the spirit of all power to the people, meaning black power to black people, white power to white people, red power to red people, brown power to brown people, yellow power to uh, the yellow people, that the system understands that. And so we've got to organize around our needs, but we also need to communicate. It's no accident that this room is such a multicultural room right now and such a crosswalk of professions and lives and talent. So I urge people that, and I thank you for coming out, but get to know what other because this is the energy, energy that it will take to make human transformation. Thank you so much.
I'm going to ask Jamal just a couple of questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience. But but the the, the first question I want to start with that intrigued me in the book is is about revolution, because at at one point you're you're talking about a debate that you were having in the party about how soon revolution would come. Would it be within a year, three years, five years, ten years? So so talk to us about that. Well, we you know we we were young people. You know I was. Uh, one of the babies of the movement because I joined the Panther Party at 15. But that day in the Panther office, uh, the people who were in the office were um, 17, 18, 19 years old. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, the average age of, the, of a Panther was about 20 years old. So I, I, I think I was 15 when I was joined. Now, what were you, 16? Where's now Rogers? Yeah, now, now Rogers was 16. Charles Barron, what were you, about 16 years old? Uh, you were 18. Bullwhip, how old were you? Okay, you were old guy. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and, then, and then, but then you, then when you came other places, like for example here on the campus of Columbia, mm -hmm. uh, there, there were the young people from SDS. And there was a Young Lords Party, and there was a group in New York called Iwa Kun, which was the Harmonious Fist. So <clears throat> one of the great things that would happen is that before and after those rallies and takeovers, you would sit and you would talk about what were unique to the struggles of different communities. And you listened to each other. Mm -hmm. So you came back to the black community talking about women's rights, mm -hmm. talking about what was happening in the Asian community, the Latino community. Uh, and so one night after a takeover in Columbia, we were hanging out right here in one of the dorm rooms, and we started getting into this heated debate, young people, <laughs> about how long the revolution would take. We were going to figure it out right there that night. <laughs> one guy said three years. We were like, you pessimistic, you reactionary, how's it going to be? <laughs> we debated on and on into the night, and finally about three in the morning, we said, well, after all, this is the heart and soul of the military industrial complex. It's going to take 10 years. <laughs> and we declared it and figured it out. Um, but it was the feeling that change was going to come. Mm. The youth movement and the anti-war movement did end the war in Vietnam. Mm. Um, I think what we underestimate was just how viciously the government would respond. And you can't have a conversation about the Black Panther Party, in fact, about all progressive movements, without talking about uh, the FBI's counterintelligence program, mm -hmm. COINTELPRO. Mm -hmm. And what COINTEL did in terms of infiltrating organizations, turning members against one another, planting false evidence, ruining people's lives, mm -hmm. um, uh, all with the blessing of Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, and in even the conflicts, a lot of the things that ha happen uh, between local Panther chapters and local police departments was at the manipulation of COINTELPRO by using their insiders in the counterintelligence saying is like, we can get you some weapons, you better arm up because the police are getting ready to come, and then taking that very same, the, the, uh, uh, very same intelligence to the police department saying, the Panthers are building up, they're getting ready to attack, you better do a preemptive strike. Mm -hmm. So on all sides, not only were, were, laws, were laws violated, lives were lost and ruined. So on this point of, of agents provocateurs, can you take us and describe the moment when your mentor, Yedwa, when you discovered that he wasn't who, he, who you thought he was? But you also mentioned that Afeni actually knew or had a sense that he was working for the cops or the CIA, whomever. Yeah, Ye Yewa was uh, someone that we described as a crazy brother. Mm -hmm. So he was that panther that, uh, it, you know, if we were at a rally and the cops were advancing, he'd rush ahead and start shoving and swinging mm -hmm. and want to take them on. Mm -hmm. uh, if we were helping to organize a building in Harlem um, by showing the tenants how to do a rent strike, and how to make, put the money in escrow and make the repairs and then you know, get some landlord tenant lawyers to represent them, uh, he'd be like, well, where does the landlord live? Let's go find his mansion and burn it down. Mm. <laughs> and to the young brothers, this was very exciting. 
But if Fannie would say, you know, why are you doing that? This is kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, pushing it. This is like Agent Provocus tour stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but you, we, you gravitated toward that swagger. Um, and, um, it, you know, he made sure he was my section leader. This mm -hmm. was like your sergeant or your lieutenant in the Black Panther Party. And he made sure that I, uh, you know, knew the 10 point program and memorized the other stuff and showed up for the community programs. Even came to my house when my grandmother frustrated that I was too busy to clean my room and wasn't doing my chores. When she did all of that, uh, she, you know, she did what, you know, a lot of parents in the room do, went to straighten up my room and found hidden underneath my bed all of this Black Panther material. I came home that night and there was a stack of Panther papers and books and one, one and there was the Holy Bible and then there was a belt. <laughs> that was the mafia altar. I didn't see it in the <laughs> And, and, and if you see the Panther Papers, they had that great work by Emery Douglas where the mm -hmm. cops would be portrayed like pigs, you know, with mm -hmm. flies buzzing around their head. And you'd have the African children, you know, African school children looking very sweet and innocent with books over one shoulder and AK-47 <laughs> under the other shoulder. And I came in and she had all of this stuff and just was waiting for me. And she said, boy, what is this? Mm -hmm. I said, Grandma, you were in my room? She said, I'm not. No, I'm, she said, what is this? <laughs> She said, because I don't know whether to bless you with this, I, I don't know whether to bless you with this uh, belt or kill you with this Bible. <laughs> but you're not going back. And as my section leader, he came up and convinced her to let me go back. Mm. He mm. said, ma'am, if he doesn't go back, and he knew the right words to say, mm. because he said, whatever you decide is fine. Because you're his grandmother, you're my elder. But I know he's not doing well in school. I'll keep an eye on him, make sure his mm. grades go up. I'll make sure he makes his curfews. And she let me go back. Mm. Four weeks later, the, uh, uh, the door of grandma's apartment was kicked in at 4 in the morning. And I was arrested in the Panther 21 case. And as the lawyers fought and fought and fought to, uh, uh, to find out what the case was really about, under the rules of discovery, we found out that, that uh, two of the key witnesses were undercover cops. Mm -hmm. They were part of a unit here in New York that was known as the Boss Unit, the Bureau of Special Services. One of those men was Gene Roberts, uh, who had been Malcolm X's bodyguard. In fact, when Malcolm was shot, he was a few feet away. In fact, when Malcolm was uh, breathing his last breath, Gene Roberts was giving him mouth-to-mouth -mouth mm. resuscitation. He was an undercover cop. Mm. So those credentials, he came into the Black Panther Party, became a security lieutenant. And the other deeply placed cop was Yewa, mm. my mentor. Mm. Um, mm. So you talk about um, deceit, you talk about betrayal, all of those feelings. There was a mixture of confusion and heartbreak and rage because remember, I never met my dad. Found out years and la years later but my, that, that my dad actually fought alongside of Fidel Castro right. and Che Guevara and became um, a general in Cuba's military and Cuba's ambassador to, uh, to Tanzania. And grandpa had died a few years younger, so it was so much about the path of manhood mm. um, as much as it was about the politics. So I'm gonna go there. Thank you. I, for those of us that didn't know you before the book, I had no idea about your Cuban roots, much less that your biological father was a Cuban revolutionary. And at, later in the book, you speculate about the DNA, where you wonder if you have this revolutionary DNA, right? And on the other hand, as you said tonight, it was, it was the women in the party that taught you how to be a man. And I, I have to give a shout out to Kathleen Cleaver, who's here because <laughs> Professor, Professor Cleaver was my professor in grad school. I took a class with her called The Law of Slavery and Anti-Slavery, which taught me a lot as your opening remarks did, Brother Jamal. But I wanna know, I wanna know the role, can you, I wanna talk about gender for a minute in the party, which is often a controversial question. So as you described it, you said the women were doing, they were keeping the offices open, they were doing the work, the, the organizational work of keeping the party alive. Yes. What, say more about the lessons you learned from the women in the party about masculinity, about being a man, and how did those differ from what you were learning from your male mentor? How were those lessons different? One, and, and, and two, it's really important um, 
uh, you know, and there's another strong sister in the house. wasn't in the wasn't in the Panther Party, but been been part of the movement and 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 um, embodies this energy. Ebony Joanne, I have to have to I have to acknowledge Sister Ebony. But um, but but uh, the, the the sisters would make it clear when we talk about these community programs. It was the sisters who kind of kept us in check about what we needed to do. So a lot of the conversations and a lot about this community programming, taking care of the kids was important. And a lot of the sisters making it clear that, uh, that you know, uh, we need to learn how to operate those shotguns and those rifles mm -hmm. to protect the family at night. And you brothers need to learn how to make these pancakes and change these diapers <laughs> to help raise the family during the day. And this needs to be the heart and soul of, the, of this organization. Um, so understanding that at first you resented it, I think, and then you came to love that part of your service, which was the majority of your day in the Black Panther Party. And I had to say it was the soul of those sisters, and in a very principled way, talking about what the organization ab was about and what the struggle was about, making it clear to us what our work needed to be. You know, I, 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 uh, uh, one of the people from the Occupy movement uh, young people was uh, was at an event in Seattle, and she says, "You know, there's some of them, some people in the movement who are getting restless, and they want to deal with more on confrontation." I said, "You know," and and I was talking about the community aspect of it and the organization, and I said, "When I say that to people, they kind of look and they go, well, and I understand that's not glamorous, that's mm -hmm. not sexy, mm -hmm. but if the Panther Party, who really had the swagger." And no one had more talk about revolution and armed struggle. If the Panthers understood two things, that one, that you organize people around your, your, their needs, and two, that even if your goal is to come to that place of armed struggle, that if you go there before the community is ready, that community that you're supposed to be representing will hate you. Because what would happen to poor communities? Cops would roll in with tanks and with guns and barbed wires. Mm -hmm. And people would have to start be, ca be carrying uh, ID cards. Mm -hmm and check, and there would be all this frisk. Oh, wait a minute, am I talking about 1968 or 2012? <laughs> <laughs> but your real job is to raise the consciousness of the people, uh, and that's done around issues that they, that they really care about. And let me just also say our colleague, Alondra Nelson, who teaches here in sociology and women and gender studies, has a book out, Body and Soul, all about the health and medical programs of the party. Yes. So a must read. Last question from me. What's the relevance of the 10 point platform today under a black president who's not Bobby Seale? Um, uh, the 10 point program kind of remains one of the most articulate doc, uh, documents about uh, about needs in, in, in a poor community. Uh, it was written specifically about the black community, but other organizations adopted it and had mm -hmm. points and platforms that were similar. The Young Lords Party did, the Patriot Party, which was a white organization that was founded in, in Baltimore did. Um, sadly, uh, it was written, and, we, uh, and I'm, uh, I think the version you should try to look for online is the, uh, the October 1966 version. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's 40 some odd years ago. Uh, sadly, it could have been written two years ago because most of the things in the 10 point program have not been addressed. When you talk about education, when you talk about community control, when you talk about employment, when you talk about police brutality, you know, we have this resurgence. And certainly when you talk about, uh, before we open this up, I want to linger on this just for a second, the mass incarceration of young black and brown men. When I served time in prison, I, I, and I served a total of nine and a half years, uh, most of the prisons there were, were, were black and brown men, black and brown women. Uh, economics, it goes back to economics, it goes back to poor communities, not having good legal defense and all of that. It goes back to this other tier of slavery as we talked about it. America was number three in the amount of people that it had locked up behind the then Soviet Union and South Africa. Mm. About four or 500,000 people locked up. Now today, unquestionably number one, with over two million people locked up. Mm -hmm. Tell me what's wrong with that picture. Mm. 
700,000 stop and frisk here in New York, most of them black and brown boys that now get their name in a, de in a database. Not a, not a lot of them leading, leading to arrest. 90% of those stop and frisk don't lead to arrest. Tell me what's wrong with that picture. Mm -hmm. Institutes that do studies to study third and fourth grade reading scores in poor neighborhoods mm -hmm. to determine how many prisons to build in five years. Mm -hmm. In New York City, 75 to 80 percent, uh, Brother Barron, I might, that number might be low, but 75 to 80 percent of the black and brown boys who are locked up come from five zip codes. Mm. Mm. Five zip codes, mm. two in Harlem, one in Brooklyn, all from poor and black communities. And what, how, what, what do we do about it? Our response, prisons is fetishized. It's a reality TV show. Should I watch Lock Up Raw? Mm. Or should I watch up San Quentin Live? Where we see police uh, uh, guard, uh, what they call special response teams, beating people down and beating them into submission. Mm. And we come with that. Well, I think the answer to it is, and by the way, the, the, the program that I was the beneficiary of, mm -hmm. uh, where I earned degrees from, from the University of Kansas mm -hmm. and graduated with honors, and it's a real degree, I'm, trust me. My, my, Jayhawk is, <laughs> my, my Jayhawk is not behind, you know, it, he doesn't have on a baseball cap behind bars going, peace. You know. <laughs> that, <laughs> those programs don't exist anymore. Mm. Right, counterintuitive to everything, to every study that shows you that the, that the rate of recidivism lowers proportionate mm -hmm. to, the, to the amount of education. So community, I say that we have to fight, that we have to create roadblocks to jail and pathways to Yale mm. with our young black and brown boys. And of course, to Columbia, and to Morgan State, and to Morehouse, and to City College, because we know that that's the antidote and the answer. But that takes outrage and organization. And by the way, the last thing of this, and this goes back to, to the community efforts, to my brothers and sisters who fight valiantly on the front line for prison reform. If there's two million, uh, prison, two million people locked up, mainly of color, men and women, how many children of prisoners are going unmentored? Multiply that number and know we have to be doing the work, direct work with those young people. Thank you. Q&A. So please come to her right there if you have a short question. What, what, As in a, a short question and a short answer. And a short I mean, answer. Yes. Uh, how you doing, Brother Jamal? Hey, how uh, are you? I just wanted to say that uh, you've done something that Paul Wilberson, John Oliver Killen, and Ozzie Davis did. They married somebody more smarter than them. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's, 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 that's exactly right. That's exactly right. That's right. <laughs> well, that was short and sweet. <laughs> and I have no comment except he's a thousand percent right. That's the answer. How you doing? Uh, my name is Noche. I'm one of the people who's fighting against mass incarceration today. I patrol the streets out here at Grant Projects just down the block. And I uh, want, thank you. I wanted you to, uh, two things, if you could address, you spoke about COINTELPRO and the, the, uh, that targeted the leadership of the Panthers and, and the struggle. Could you also speak, as you did, Sid, about mass incarceration? Because Carl Dix, who's gonna be speaking tomorrow at Riverside, is gonna, is, uh, argues that mass incarceration developed in part as a response to that whole generation in order to, uh, you know, target the communities, black and, and Latino communities, to prevent the kind of up, uh, uprisings that happened in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, very quickly, I totally agree with that and, um, and, and, and with that analysis. You know, there, there's, a, there, there's a book out that talks about how COINTELPRO targeted Tupac uh, because Tupac was so political and was, uh, the, you, was already healing those fractures, you know, between the East Coast, West Coast. And then if people are not fighting each other, who are they fighting? That, that becomes a revolutionary force. Fred Hampton was killed in large part because of his work with the gangs in Chicago. 
because he was organizing them into a progressive force. So if this is 100,000 gang members and they, they start to understand state oppression and that they should be defending and serving the community, then where are those 100,000 guns turned to if not at each other? So that lethal potential force of an educated, progressive, nationwide army of young black and brown men that are educated. You know, when we were in the prisons, we turned them into liberation schools. Mm -hmm. Become something that I, I believe that the system wants to diffuse before it can either begin to become that gathering storm. Hey, Jamal, my name is Bruce Lincoln. So I want to ask the question, and it's a collective idea that I'm proposing. Where do we go from here? How do we take the 10 steps you just outlined from the Panther Party, make them relevant to what we need to do within uh, the context of where we are now in the 21st century? Oh, I think that's great. Wait, Bruce, don't walk away. <laughs> Give us, I think that's a good question, and I think for answers to that and gathering as a follow-up for that, it, do you have a web address or a website that you think that we can respond to to respond to those ideas? Because I think that was, the, that, that was a question and an answer into itself. I think we have to think tank it. I think that uh, uh, the only thing I'll say to that is that I think it happens on three levels. And I think, yes, policy, right? So that we are empowering progressive politicians and, and maybe not so progressive to make it. A, a quick story that Harry Belafonte tells is that um, uh, is that A. Philip Randolph, who was the great, greatest uh, labor organizer in history, uh, uh, comes to the White House and President Truman gathers his whole staff. And he says, you know, his whole cabinet, he said, I want you to listen to this man. This is a bright man and, I want, and, and a brilliant man and an honest man and listen to his ideas. And, um, and uh, uh, Mr. Randolph lays out the case of black labor and the labor movement brilliantly. And after it was done, President Truman says, I agree with everything that you said. This is important. Now I need you to get into the street and make me do it. You see what I mean? Well, that, that was Roosevelt. Yeah, that was Roosevelt. He said, now I need you to get into the street and, and, and make me do it. And so it has to be, you know, it has to be policy. It has to be the mass organizing, but it also has to be grassroots, which is the mentoring in the community program. So for those ideas and for that feedback on those things, where can we come to? You have some place that can be like a general Dropbox? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, come on, you're the digital, no, you're the I'm digital talk, guy. Okay, so, it, so for now, well, please. What I would say is, you know, I work with a group that Dorian's also involved with, the Center for Social Inclusion. So I think it's important that we bring science to how we're now addressing policy. I think so that we can bring in where there's new opportunities for philanthropic capitalism, we look at the civil rights movement, our quest for liberation as a social venture. Then we can leverage this university. Columbia has a unique history in terms of being involved in this, and there's lots of resources here right now. So I'm thinking, you know, that's sort of what we need to do. But it has to first get based on the fact that there's a knowledge base that we have in Harlem that's a continuum that makes tremendous sense. How do we now apply that to all these sort of issues? I mean, I'm working from the social venture side where it's persons like myself who are, you know, entrepreneurs who are figuring out how do we address this from an entrepreneurial standpoint and we're figuring out ways to raise monies in those very places where back in the day or even today they're figuring out how to build prisons, right? So, but I think it has well, to I've get... Yeah, no, I wouldn't even... No, no, it's say cool. So I'll tell you what but we do. But I think it's, this, it's to it, continue the creative the conversation. idea drives it from someone such as yourself. Right. And so to then it's got to connect to... Just to facilitate the conversation, uh, I, 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 I do thanks to, uh, to Michael Washington and some, and some other good people have a website. Is Michael in the house? Yeah. So drop me. Uh, there's a website called jamaljoseph.com. There's an email address on that. Drop ideas for continuing the conversation there, and we'll try to sort it out and see if we can follow up with, with ongoing conversations. There you go. Great. So in the interest of time, let's take three comments and then have Professor Joseph respond. Are there some sisters that want to ask a question? <laughs> we got too much testosterone up here. <laughs> let's take everybody's comment, and then we'll wrap up with the, with the stuff. Everybody that's there now. OK. okay. Yes.
Yes, I've been talking about it a lot. There wasn't time tonight, but it was so important. And, and of course, this is who I am now. I'm a, a progressive artist. And that work was done by people like Amelia Baraka and Sonia Sanchez uh, uh, during the 60s and understanding that art also had to, oh, and wait a minute. Uh, there's a little artist named Embry Douglas that was part of the black arts movement. And understanding that the only culture worth, worth keeping is a revolutionary culture. And I learned in prison the transformative power and the revolutionary power of art. So very important. Absolutely. So let's, let's kind of take comments really and then we'll, quickly, we'll we try to do one closing Really comment. quickly because we impact has to Impact is up. Y'all want to see impact, don't you? <laughs> okay. Peace, Jamal. Hey, this peace. is not really a question for you because I can see the fruits of your labor through the babies up there that impact is and the powerful impact, no pun intended, that makes from the community. My question to everybody here, because I take a look around and I don't really see the youth besides the youth up there. My question is how can you connect, empower, inspire, enhance the development of the young people in the community who are the tomorrows of today's yesterday that we're seeing now. How can you do that through your actions without the judgment of the kids wearing their pants down to their ankles and to the teenage babies? How can you do that? That's my question to you. Great. Very Thank good. You. Thank you for that. Comment, comment, comment. Yes. Brother Jamal, my brother, uh, I'm just here to let you know uh, we in the house from the townhouse to you. And uh, you just keep doing right on what you're doing and we got your back. Power to the Thank people. you, brother. Brother Dean Jamal Joseph. Oh, thank you. You have a St. Croix connection that says hi. Oh, thank you so much. That's Chief Okino, by the way. Chief Okino, who is a brilliant leader of, of, of not only of native people here up and down the East Coast, but a brilliant scientist. Peace, brother. Peace. Um, if uh, we have time, can you just take a moment and uh, talk about your personal sacrifices that you have suffered or that you have gone through as a result mm -hmm. of making a, a, a choice at the age of 15 mm -hmm. to, be, to be dedicated towards the freedom and the upliftment of our people? Okay, we'll try, I'll, I'll try to put that in the wrap up. Yes. I think we, I think people on, if you're not on the, the line, oh, right Pam, here. Pam, it has to, with, yeah, you're the last person, Sister Pam. Mm -hmm. I saw a Panther sister there, and mm -hmm. I was like, I was going to say before, but nah, I can't. <laughs> That's a Panther sister, go ahead. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, how much of, um, you mentioned that your father wasn't really in your life. How much of a difference do you think that your father would have had if he was there for you? I'm sorry, I didn't fully understand that, sister. Like, how much of a difference do you think your fa your father would have had in your life if he was there? I, you know, it's hard to know um, how much of a difference. I, I hear great things about him, um, but it's it's just hard to know. But I know that not having a father made my journey of not only trying to be a a personally a good father to to my children but to mentor and to be there for, for as many young people as I can over the years, really important. Yeah, can we, can we I, don't, I didn't want to ignore the guys who were on. Dominic, where did you go? And Dominic Boyce? Okay, okay Dominic, I, knew, I really need your comment. Come back, please. Yeah, go ahead, Pam. Um, hi, Jamal. I was 14 when I joined. I oh, yeah. Okay. See, there so, we are. There but, it is. Um, okay. Having been a political prisoner and been fortunate enough to be released, um, how, what are your thoughts on how COINTELPRO has ruined all those lives that are still behind the walls? I'd like to, for you to address that. Well, they, those lives continue to be destroyed. When you talk about people... Um, like Mubia Abu Jamal, when you talk about Sekou Dinga, Sundiari Okoli, who continue to be leaders in prison, but have had to, in the best way that they could, try to be fathers and husbands from behind the walls. We're talking about lives and lifetimes of law and concentric circles that have been affected by 
by what COINTELPRO did. We really have to end it there. Please join me in thanking Professor Joseph for a stimulating. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do not, do not, do not, do not go anywhere. Give us one minute to clear the stage so we can see and hear impact.